Welcome to Saints Rest. We're so glad you're here, Orlando. Awesome to see your smiling face and good to meet you and I hope you enjoy the service. And uh, please, we invite anybody that enjoys what they uh, experience here to invite other people. So um, the convenient thing about us meeting at five is that you can go to your home church in the morning <laughs> and visit us in the afternoon. So um, that works out good. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, first of all, if you don't have a bulletin, grab this. Cameron will have one for you if it's not in your chair. And pay attention to the uh, QR code on the very back. You can scan that with your phone, and you can get some, some more information and updates on what we're doing throughout the week and prayer requests, et cetera. So that's pretty handy. Um, <clears throat> the other announcement, so we are wrapping up this Wednesday the, the book study, uh, The Good God. Uh, so we'll wrap up chapter five, which is the end of it. And then the next Wednesday, we will, Reagan and I will be preparing to leave the country. So for those next three weeks, so, so we'll meet on Wednesday, we'll finish the study. And then for the next three weeks, we will not meet for a small group. And then we'll pick back up when we return. Actually, having small group. We are. <laughs> they are having small group. <laughs> okay. Okay, we will clarify this on, the, <laughs> on that QR code. That'll be a real handy way to get the official information. Thank you. Um, all right, so our service, just to remind everyone, is organized around four basic things. We are uh, looking at and, and re being reminded of who God is, our need for him, how he fulfills that need, and then how we can look forward to love others out of gratitude for what he has done for us. And uh, so that we may delight in sharing this good news with others. Now then, at Saints Rest, you will receive a steady diet of the law and the gospel to be pointed outside of ourselves to the unchanging, all-sufficient Christ. And we pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit and out of the overflow of love that God the Father has for his Son, and out of the overflow of the love that the Son has for His church, that we will love you well, our guests, brothers, and sisters in Christ. Now, if you are able, please join us as we stand joyfully for the call to worship. To all who are weary of trying to be good enough and need rest, to all who mourn their condition and are longing for comfort, to all who feel worthless and fail, and to all who sin and need a Savior, Jesus Christ, the gentlest, most accessible person in the entire universe, invites you to come to him and rest. Please listen as our gentle shepherd calls us to worship from Psalm chapter 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his host. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all stars of light. Praise him, highest heavens and the waters that are above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord. For he commanded and they were created. He has also established them forever and ever. He has made a decree which will not pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, beast and all cattle, creeping things and winged fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and virgins, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven, and he has lifted up a horn for his people. Praise for all his godly ones, even for the sons of Israel, a people near to him. Praise the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, you are the rock of our salvation, and as you've called us, we come to you now to worship and bow down with joy and thanksgiving. We lift our hearts and our voices to adore you, our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you for this Lord's Day, this one day out of seven that you've given to us 
together as your people with the promise of your presence in word and in sacrament. Bless this gathering today, Lord. Receive us in Christ and raise us up to the heavenly places in him. Remind us of our need for your grace and mercy by your law and renew our dependence on Christ by your gospel. Turn our eyes outward to be put back to rest in Christ. Be glorified as we receive and rest in our risen Savior. To the glory of your redeeming love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we lift our voices unified as one to praise your name, saying, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Let's remind one another of the glories of our God as we sing together.
Please be seated. Please join me on page three of your bulletin as we focus on the law, specifically Jesus' summary of the law from Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 through 40. Hear the law of the Lord. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God's law has been written into creation itself. God gave it to Adam as a covenant of works, meaning that upon perfect obedience, life would be the reward. However, as we're all aware, perfect obedience wasn't achieved, meaning death and corruption was the consequence for all of us. This corruption was passed down to all of Adam's descendants, according to the flesh, that is each one of us. God delivered this same law and Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai as the perfect rule of righteousness. Now, looking at God's perfect law, we're reminded of how far we fall short of his righteousness in our flesh. The law fights against our constant temptation to lukewarmness by reminding us of our infinite need and that Jesus Christ is therefore our only righteousness. Let's look at question 93 of the Westminster Larger Catechism to study the moral law with the church. Question 93, what is the moral law? The moral law is the declaration of the will of God to mankind, directing and binding everyone to personal, perfect, and perpetual conformity and obedience to it in the frame and disposition of the whole man, soul, and body, and in performance of all those duties of holiness and righteousness which he owes to God and man, promising life upon the fulfilling and threatening death upon the breach of it. Has there ever been a moment that any of us have truly loved the Lord perfectly? And can we say we've ever truly loved our neighbor to the required level of perfection? Yet God's law demands that we perfectly do so in every thought, word, and deed, every day of our lives. This is actually what righteousness looks like according to God. The truth is we have no righteousness of our own. But praise God, he has provided a righteousness apart from the law and the obedience of Jesus Christ in our place. In light of his overwhelming grace, we're free to bring our unrighteousness directly to him, confessing our sins. And as we do, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So together, as one unified body, and looking at page four of the liturgy, let's bear one another's burdens as we draw near to the throne of grace together and confess our sins. Almighty Father, in light of our salvation in Christ, we ask you to have mercy on us and forgive our sins. Renew us through your spirit and lead us to put sin to death and live holy lives. Amen. Please stand as we continue our confession and song. Yes, yes. 
What a wonderful song to sing, Kyrie eleison, meaning Christ have mercy. And that's what St. Therese does here to, on behalf of Christ, proclaim good news to sinners for. So after hearing the law and confessing our sins, we now get to turn to see the Lamb of God who's taken away our sins. And he's now the mediator between us and the Father. And we can be reminded of the righteousness and the forgiveness of sins that we have in him. Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 23. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you believe this good news, that he who promised is faithful to provide us a way to enter the holy place, and that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can have full assurance of faith and be cleaned from our evil consciences? Then, saints, it is my joy to declare that just as God has spoken to you in Hebrews 10, God has created a way for you through his son, Jesus Christ. We may now draw near to the throne of grace with full assurance and be washed clean by the authority of God's word. Your sins have been forgiven. Let's continue to instruct one another in this wonderful gospel as we sing.
Please be seated. Just as we heard leading into the catechism earlier, we study God's word with the church. The Apostles' Creed represents the church's summary of the most important teachings of Scripture. As we join our voices with the church of every era, we understand ourselves to be part of the one universal Catholic body of Christ. Please join me on the bottom of page seven as we confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we join together to express our deep gratitude for the forgiveness and rest that you so graciously provide. With joy and thanksgiving, we celebrate this finished work in love of Jesus Christ. For the ongoing encouragement, support, and wisdom of the Grace Reform Network and our sending church, Reforming Truth, we are so thankful. And we want to continually be in prayer for our brothers and sisters in all of these like-minded churches, specifically this week for Covenant Baptist Church in Asheville, North Carolina, led by Pastor and GRN founder, Justin Perdue. As their entire community copes with the devastation of Hurricane Helene, we pray Covenant Baptist would trust you, know you are near, and that you care for them very much. We pray the floodwaters will recede 
very soon and that drinking water and power will be restored to that community. We pray for effective communication and wisdom to serve those with the greatest needs. We pray the church would care for each other in the weeks to come, that they would love and serve their neighbors well, and you would bless those efforts within the larger community. We also pray for our friends at Providence Reformed Church in Glen Rose, Texas, led by Pastor Brandon Mills. Specifically, that they would trust in your timing and Providence to be officially sent as a GRM church. Guard the clarity of the gospel, the Mills family and their church family, because we know all too well what it means to be eager to join a church network like GRN. As a close neighbor, show us how to best partner with Providence Reformed in the coming months to provide encouragement and service to one another. And now we pray for our own pastors, Timothy and Cameron, that you would bless them and their families, safeguard them from every manner of temptation and attack, that they would lead us with great joy in gospel clarity. May we faithfully encourage all ministry leaders that are committed to gospel clarity in Midland, the state of Texas, and beyond. May we run the race together with endurance and humility, leaning solely on you for strength. And as we're reminded of the depth and breadth of your love, Lord, may your Holy Spirit compel us to pass on this selfless love to one another. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Please join me for the reading of today's passage. It's in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13 through 15, or you can see it on page 8 of the bulletin. Listen carefully to this passage as we prepare our hearts for today's sermon. For you are called the freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in this statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for yet another Lord's Day. God, we thank you for these precious saints gathered here. We thank you for providing this gathering for us, Lord. Not only for planting us as a church, but also giving us the means of grace. Lord, where you promise to be with us in a unique way in the gathering of these saints as we sit under your word, partake of your sacraments. So, Father, we ask for you to, your blessing to be on this time. Father, we ask that you would bless both the preaching and the hearing of your word now. And God, that you would teach us in the inner man and bear much fruit from your holy scriptures, God. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. So if you would, go ahead and turn to Galatians chapter 5, or look at page 8 in your liturgy. So Paul has spent, from the beginning of Galatians, he spent four and a half chapters refuting the lies of the Judaizers and instead arguing for the faith once for all handed down to the saints. But Paul was refuting these men who had come into the churches of Galatia, teaching that we are saved by Christ plus things worked in us or done by us. And then as we've seen over the last several passages, he moved kind of more from the more targeted teaching to begin to appeal to the churches of Galatia, to turn away from these wolves and to return to the purity of Christ and his gospel. Chapter 5, verse 1 represented a, a very good summary of this whole letter. Paul said, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. As of today's passage, where we find ourselves, Paul keeps with the apostolic pattern. And now that he has established Christ, now that he's given Jesus Christ to the churches in clarity, he now turns and begins to exhort the churches to live godly lives, to pursue good works, to flee from sin, 
and pursue works of love in light of the grace of Christ, in light of the grace in which they stand. And then secondarily, as we begin to see Paul describing what good works are, what they look like, he is at the same time dealing yet another blow to the false teachings of the Judaizers. Men who made such a big deal about works, but in reality were exhorting the Galatians to useless outer conformity to ceremonies never pointing to the actual fruit of the Christian life, love. And so Paul is here subverting them yet again by showing them what real, actual good works are, what they look like. So today's passage actually begins with a continuation of that chapter 5, verse 1 we just read. It was for freedom that we were set free. Paul picks that idea back up here in verse 13. Uh, and this idea that as believers, we've been set free from Christ, by Christ. But in light of that, in light of our freedom in Christ, what is God's purpose for that freedom that we enjoy in this present evil age? What outcome has he designed our freedom to produce? Paul answers in this passage and next week's passage, I've broken this up into a two-part sermon here. So let's begin by looking at verse 13, Galatians 5. For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. So again, Paul begins reiterating the good news of chapter 5, verse 1. You were called to freedom, brethren. If you'll remember, uh, I believe a sermon before last when we were covered that verse, our freedom is a central purpose of our salvation. Christ came and did all that he did in order to set us free. If you'll remember, freedom mainly consists in freedom from wrath, since Christ has satisfied it at the cross, and freedom from the burden to merit God's approval, since he obeyed perfectly on our behalf, fulfilling the law. And then arising out of those two central aspects of the gospel, he brought us freedom of conscience before God by silencing the law with its threats, and Satan with his accusations. But looking at the second part of verse 13, this freedom is something we are capable of misapplying. He says, only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. Saints, this is a real temptation. One that I have no doubt you, like me, are familiar with. Abusing grace is a very logical implication to the flesh. The logic of this abuse goes something like this. The gospel announces that we will never face God's wrath. And we're already credited with every good work God requires for righteousness. What's to stop us? from engaging in whatever occurs to the flesh, will be forgiven, right? Saints, we all know that is an abuse of grace. Taking the grace of Christ in vain can be a real temptation. Our spirits correctly perceive the freedom that we have in Christ. That's why that temptation is so tempting, because... It's based on truth. We will never face wrath. He has fulfilled all righteousness. And so taking that grace in vain can be a real temptation. But our spirits, our spirits correctly perceive this freedom, but our flesh hears that same good news and seeks to take advantage of it, to turn it into an ugly abuse of Christ and His grace. 
We all know the temptation to take the freedom of spirit given to us in the gospel and turn it into freedom of flesh. But as we also know, at least those who have been alive long enough to learn this lesson, the freedom of the flesh is a lie. The supposed freedom of the flesh, this lawlessness, is not freedom at all. In reality, it's a cruel slavery to Satan and our passions, which are in agreement with him. Listen, saints, the liberty that Christ has brought to us is a spiritual benefit. It's a Godward freedom. It exists in our conscience. It doesn't belong to the flesh with its destructive desires, but to the inner man. But the flesh will seek to steal this freedom for its desires. That's in large part what Paul's getting at in verse 17, part of next week's passage. For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. To allow our flesh to misconstrue the freedom of Christ as freedom to lawlessness brings nothing but suffering and destruction for us and those around us. We'll hear much more about that later. So even bringing this up, this struggle that we all know, I feel the need to give a quick aside here. If you're being convicted of this as we hear Paul's words, listen carefully to this reminder. When we're tempted, or when we actually do abuse grace, using it as an opportunity for the desires of the flesh, listen to the unexpected answer of Christ's covenant. When you stumble and abuse the grace of Christ, Remember his unchanging grace. Your ingratitude hasn't changed him or his gospel one single bit. When you stumble in that way, when we stumble in that way, remember the law and the gospel. Remember you don't now nor have you ever possessed a righteousness of your own. But everything that you lack, Christ has supplied for you. And everything you owed, Christ has paid. When you stumble and turn, the gra- turn grace into an occasion for sin, let the love you receive as an unworthy sinner, saved by grace, bring you right back home. You can never wear out your welcome before the throne of grace, dear sinner saints. So let his unconditional love turn you back to your Father. Let his grace repent you. Bring you back home to an agreement with him on the sinfulness of sin and of his way of salvation in Christ. And out of that love you receive, bring the members of your body back into subjection to their true task. To be the instruments by which he expresses his love to those around you. The demand of our flesh to have its desires fulfilled is a real and constant battle. That's why we must be exhorted to deny the flesh in the freedom of Christ and to continually subject our flesh to his call to love out of the love we've received. I've been hinting at it, but God's actually provided something to replace our habit, our our temptation, our action of fulfilling these lusts. He's given a good and noble task to keep our bodies busy. 
And that's what Paul goes on to teach us. What we're to do with this earthly existence in the freedom of Christ. The last part of verse 13. But through love, serve one another. This expands what we heard last week in verse 6, when Paul mentioned faith working through love. The love that, of, of Jesus that is poured into us through faith by word and sacrament week after week, receiving His grace is, is a lesson that we've been learning so well as a church. But saints, the point here, as it fills us, let it spill over. Love isn't merely affectionate feelings. It isn't wishing others well or some token act like shaking hands or some form of physical affection. Paul defines love. He says, through love, serve one another. Love acts it's active. And the actions of love take the form of humble service. The purpose of our earthly members, our earthly existence, our bodies, our, the entirety of our lives in this present evil age, the purpose of it is for it to be submitted to the wholesome works of love that we see so clearly in God's law. This is the antidote to misusing our freedom in Christ. When we receive the freedom and love of Christ, saints, cherish it in your spirits. Walk in that freedom of conscience that he's brought to you. And let that love grow up and constrain your earthly body. Insist that it only be used as the instrument of love's overflow. Peter, in 1 Peter 2.16, he says, Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bonds, bond slaves of God. In Romans 6.12-14, Paul says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Saints, we're bad at this. It's a real struggle. And it's real sin when we do fall short. But Christ meets our real sin with real forgiveness every single time. He cleanses us. He gives us mercy. He gives us more and more grace every time we come to Him with our sin. And guess what, saints? That reality frees us to go out and try again. Our forgiven sins are simply more and more occasions to go out with greater and greater motivation. Because there are more and more occasions to see the depth of His love, to understand it. Knowing that He delights in our imperfect works of love done in faith. And do you know what you're doing when you love the saints? Y'all, you know, God is invisible. And so he's given you the honor of making him visible to the flock. That's why fellowship in the gathering of the church is a means of grace. So what does love look like? What does this love look like? If it's not merely affection, but it's definite acts of service, we might be at a bit of a loss, especially day to day, right? As we consider how to 
love one another, build one another up. Look at verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So Paul spent this letter arguing against false doctrine that misplaced the law, that pointed the saints to the law for righteousness. If it seems odd that after all that he said about the law being fulfilled, about it having served its purpose, and after going so hard after teachers who inappropriately bind the church with the law, if it seems weird that he's now exhorting the church to obey the law, you may be missing some key elements of Scripture's teaching. Christ has set us free from the law as a covenant. He's fulfilled the do this and live, do this or die of the covenant of works. But as we've heard before, the law itself pre-existed the covenant of works. It's the elemental principles of the world, as Paul called it earlier in this book. God revealing his will for the moral conduct of those made in his image, that is not burdensome in and of itself. God giving the law as a covenant, saying do this or die, that's what makes the law a burden. That's what Paul was going against. That's what's been fulfilled by Jesus Christ. When Christ fulfilled the law by his perfect obedience, when he gained God's approval by his works and satisfied our curse at his cross, everything that made the law burdensome was forever taken away. What we're left with is the perfect guide. Because God's desires haven't changed. The love that the law commands and pictures for us is and always will be good and right and wholesome. And that law that's built into the very moral fabric of the universe itself is perfectly expressed in the Ten Commandments given on Mount Sinai. So the law no longer stands to declare us righteous or condemned before God. Christ is our righteousness, and He satisfied our condemnation. The law no longer has a say in that matter. And, and our works, either good or evil, aren't taken into account, because all is for Christ's sake. But the law remains. And it remains to show us the love our Father desires us to display. And it still reveals the sin that He hates. The sin that still has the power to destroy our lives and those around us. It reveals with crystal clarity what's wholesome and good and noble. The gospel tells us we're free. The law as our guide encourages us to pursue that which is beautiful in that freedom. Another potentially confusing part of this verse, Paul says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he's addressing that to the church. Hasn't Paul been abundantly clear that we do not fulfill the law? That Christ alone has fulfilled the law and that that is the good news? Part of it. Our tradition has very helpfully defined what's going on here. The law is a covenant or the law is a tutor to use Paul's language. That mirror that reveals that we have no righteousness and that we're condemned unless God provides a way of escape. That crushing function of the law is what our tradition calls the law in its first use. The law as a guide. 
once the burden to earn our approval by God has been taken away in Christ. And we're left with the laws of just a picture of the will of our gentle father. That's what we call the third use of the law. So no, Paul's not schizophrenic. When he speaks of the saints fulfilling the law, he's speaking in terms of the third use, not the first. We fulfill it in the sense of our faith imperfectly working through love, as was mentioned last week. It's the saints trusting in Christ as our only righteousness and satisfaction, and then walking in the works he's prepared for us to walk in. These are good works done in gratitude, not for merit. Works done in conformity to the law, thoroughly stained with all of our remaining corruption, and yet received in Christ, cleansed in His blood, and therefore acceptable and well-pleasing to the Father. We're said to fulfill the law in its third use, when we love out of the love we received in Christ. Not for righteousness, but as sons. Think of it this way. Our good friend Brad Kafer, he shared a wonderful illustration on a recent, no, yeah, a, a recent episode of the Reclamation. And it went something like this. Imagine a father inviting his son to work on a car with him. He takes him into the garage. He gives the little boy a wrench. He shows him where to put the wrench and says, okay, now turn it. The son didn't actually do anything valuable. The father didn't need him to do it. He, in fact, the boy probably just got in the way, to be honest. But the father desired to bring his son along to invite him into the work he's doing. And he responds, you did it. You fixed the car. Good job. In the exact same way, our Father, our Heavenly Father, says, you are my sons. I've redeemed you. I've adopted you in my Son, I've clothed you in His righteousness. Now come join me in my work. You see, your sister over there, go show her my love. And then he says, you did it. Good job. You fulfilled the law. In reality, we did no such thing. But our Father receives and even uses our bumbling, imperfect works for Christ's sake. He justifies even our works in His blood and righteousness. What a precious thing it is for us to present our members as instruments of His love, letting it spill over from us to our neighbor. Paul says the whole law is fulfilled in one word, In the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. As yet another thing you might be asking, why does Paul say the whole law is fulfilled in one word? And then quote the summary of just the second table of the law. Right? We heard the summary of the law in our reading of the law earlier. Love God and love neighbor. Paul quotes love neighbor and says the whole law is fulfilled in that. What's going on there? He seems to skip love for God. The reality is, love for God, again, as we know, born in us because he first loved us in Christ, right? But love for God is invisible. Love for neighbor is the visible fruit of love for God. If we show love for neighbor in the freedom of Christ, then love for God is already present. And again, we're speaking in third use terms here. Those walking in the freedom of Christ through faith. This is the purpose of the freedom we've been given in Christ. The truth is, obedience 
can only come from freedom. The great irony of inappropriately law-heavy or law-gospel-mixing beliefs is that such stinginess with Christ and His grace, fencing the grace that God gives freely, that's actually the enemy of Christian obedience. Such preachers, such beliefs want to force godliness. They want hooks and barbs to drag the saints along into holiness. But in reality, they're denying its power. The gospel itself is the teaching that accords with godliness, according to 1 Timothy 6. So fencing the grace of God with the law or mixing law and gospel actually has the opposite effect. It provokes sin. It doesn't tend to godliness. What an amazing, profound, and useful summary of the law this is, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Looking at the last six commandments, there's so much we can learn there about what love looks like, especially if we study the word with the church. But this summary captures it all. If you're ever in doubt about what love looks like in any given situation, you already have the key. It's built into us. So consider and ask yourself, how do I serve my own needs? How do I want my person, my relationships, my property, and my reputation to be respected? In reliance on Christ, as we let His love spill over from our earthly members, we do so by performing those same things for our neighbor. That's what it looks like. Our neighbor, those that God in His providence has placed in our sphere of influence, right? Placed around us, was made in His image. This is how we serve one another through love, as Paul's calling us to. This is how we love our neighbor as ourself. God calls us to use our freedom to subject our flesh to love. This usually isn't something grandiose. It might not even be something visible. It usually isn't noticed or definitely not valued much by the world. But good, but it's good and it's acceptable through faith in Christ. It's what God calls good works. The humble service of love is very often carried out in the context of our vocation, our occupations, the the places we spend most of our time out in the world. And it's often carried out in small, seemingly uh, insignificant ways. It might look like patience toward our unruly kids or a difficult spouse. It looks like bearing with the faults and the annoying traits and the failures and the selfishness of the world around us. It looks like encountering such disappointments of those and giving humble service in return. It looks like coming to the aid of everyone according to our need, our means, comforting the afflicted, lifting up the weak, sharing, promoting, and adorning the gospel at every chance, pursuing a quiet life in all godliness and dignity. Our Father calls these good works. And He receives them in Christ and is delighted by them when we do them in freedom. Not for merit, not not out of fear of punishment, for not doing them, but from simple gratitude at rest in Christ. His love overflowing in us to our neighbors as we yield our members to that love. These things adorn the gospel. What a privilege is that? 
that God's given us that privilege to adorn His gospel by His works of grace that He works in us. Consider the gift that the church is, saints. God has given us a family where all together as one, we are deepening in our reliance on Christ and deepening in our reception of His love. We're being brought along by the hand to let all of His goodness overflow. We're being built into a gathering of mutual love, protection and edification. What a beautiful calling our Father gives us. Saints, pressing on in grace to constrain our earthly bodies to serve one another through love in the freedom of Christ is worth it. But there's a flip side to this. Not only do we pursue what's good, in our freedom, but that also implies fleeing from what's evil. Let's pick up at verse 15. But if you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. As a reminder, Paul began by saying, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh. While we've been renewed in the inner man, the changed part of us that desires to love God and neighbor, our flesh remains. Again, as Paul will say in verse 17, the sanctifying spirit of God in us wars against our flesh and our flesh against the spirit. That's the norm of the Christian life. This war that we long to be done with. But it is the reality of our lives. The flesh remains and it is never sanctified in this life. It's assault against our performance of the good we desire will continue. As we'll hear next week. We're lifted above the flesh and its desires in communion with the Father through gospel faith. That's what it means to walk by the Spirit. But the flesh will harass and frustrate us in our desires to walk in His beautiful love that we've been hearing about. Till we die or He returns. This is why we must be exhorted to keep our eyes fixed on Christ and to use our freedom to constrain our earthly members. In the situation of the churches of Galatia, their flesh manifested in a very specific way due to their doctrinal disunity and the nature of the error being that they were turning to. This same manifestation of the flesh is particularly seen in legalistic, law-heavy, law-gospel-mixing churches, biting and devouring. Where a legal frame prevails, you will consistently find that body eating their own. When confidence is placed in things worked in us or done by us, they must have a keepable standard. There's little use for the actual law in that frame. The actual law whose standard is absolutely unkeepable in the flesh. And being ignorant of the gospel, they can't consistently proclaim Scripture's unkeepable law. And so they create laws they can keep in the flesh. And being deluded into thinking they're pulling it off before God they very naturally will grow indignant with those around them that they feel aren't living up to what they are. The fruit of this is always challenging and biting one another. Sowing to the flesh in this way 
always reaps the rotten fruit of self-destruction. Not loving one another in the gentleness of Christ. To bite and devour one another is the opposite of love. Where love is selfless, biting and devouring is the fruit of self-absorption. Harming one another to serve one's own appetites. This sin brings a cruel and destructive death to a church. Anywhere it's found. We must be warned against this fruit of the flesh. And flee to Christ wherever it may be found in us. This looks like slander, accusations, disputes, petty reproaches, abusive language, all the opposite of love. And the inevitable result of biting and devouring is to be mutually consumed. Biting and devouring begets biting and devouring until all are swallowed up in hate. The Galatians were bearing this fruit of the flesh because of the law, gospel, mixing, teaching that they were turning to. But make no mistake, no matter how much we might think we're being careful to distinguish between the law and the gospel, this is not merely a them problem. This is a flesh problem. And it's therefore a danger for all saints and all churches. And we have to be clear. It is not only self-absorbed, ambitious infighting that will consume a church. Listen carefully. Sin, all sin, is destructive by nature. There's no such thing as a small sin. And there's no such thing as a victimless sin either. We depend, in part, on the fruit that Christ bears in the saints around us. Pursuing sin, any sin, by definition, curves you inward and curbs your loving out of the love you've received. Praise God that he so often restrains the destruction that's present in all sin. We have an enemy who can and is seeking to absolutely destroy us. He cannot snatch us away from Christ, but he can ruin lives. He seeks to destroy us, our families, our church. This is why repentance is such a gift and one that we long to grow in by the grace of Christ and one that he's promised to grow us in by the means of grace. So listen carefully, saints. Everything will be okay at Christ's return and our resurrection. We sin, and that is not okay, but it's going to be okay. But don't let that reality lull you into the lie that sin won't bite you here and now. God has not promised to shield us from the harmful earthly effects of sin. We must fight against it by the gospel, by the ongoing grace of Christ and the consolation of the brethren. There is great power in walking in light by being vulnerable and confessing our sins to one another. Because where sin is left unchecked, it consumes. We are always playing with fire when we give up in the fight against sin by the grace of Christ. But at the end of it all, remember the hope from last week that we heard about. He will wipe away every tear. We will be raised incorruptible 
fully righteous, fully conformed to the image of Christ. And every sin of this age will only be more and more trophies of his grace for all eternity. Listen to me, precious sinner saints. Everything is already settled before the Father. Your verdict has already been read in the resurrection of Christ. Not guilty, righteous. So when temptation arises, flee to him in his grace. When you fall to temptation, never leave it unconfessed and unchecked. But bring every one of your sins to the throne of grace. Hide yourself in the one who has placed his name upon you. Your ongoing sins are more and more invitations to bury yourself in his loving arms. So bring them to the throne of grace for cleansing and for the power to put them to death in the grace and freedom of Christ. Jesus, the author of your faith, will certainly be the finisher of your faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for adopting us as your own sons. Thank you that in your kindness, you invite us into your own work to be instruments of your love to the world. What a privilege. Father, give us the grace to flee from every sin, no matter how small we may perceive it to be, and to submit our earthly bodies as instruments of humble service. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your keeping and restraining power. Lead us to put sin to death and live holy lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. And now, having heard the good news that Christ is our only peace before the Father, Jesus now invites us to his table to renew his covenant with us and to seal these promises to our hearts. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave his disciples an ongoing sign of what he was about to do for them on the cross and a sign that he also gives to us who believe through their word. Listen to Paul's account of the institution of this supper in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The word of God is living and active. So as we hear Christ giving these elements, we understand that it's Christ himself who holds these elements out to us to strengthen our faith through this sign and seal of his work for us and our union with him. As surely as we see this bread given and broken for us and this cup given to us, and as surely as we receive and partake of them by faith, so surely has Christ given himself for us and united us to himself. This supper is a call to deepen in our reliance on Christ and all that he's done and is doing for us. And the more that our rest in Jesus deepens, the more that we deepen in our conscious fellowship with the living Christ around his table. This table is medicine for the sick, sustenance for the weak, and it's a wonderful reminder for the forgetful. We come to this table as sinners, to the Savior of sinners. We come worthily to the table when we come as the unworthy. And we come to the Savior who invites us and makes us worthy. So if you're coming in agreement with God concerning your sin, and Christ is your only hope for righteousness, forgiveness, and eternal life, and if you're a baptized member of a church that preaches the gospel of God's free grace in Christ, and you are under the discipline of this or any such body, 
then I invite you in the name of Jesus Christ to come to this table, to come and receive all that Christ holds out to you by faith. Come with joy in gospel faith, bringing all of your needs and your weaknesses to Christ and receive his perfect sufficiency set before you here at this table. However, if you don't meet that description, I warn you in the name of Jesus Christ not to come. But know this, you're absolutely free to partake of the Lord where you're seated. His invitation is freely offered to every sinner, and it is unchanging. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the sacrament of your supper. Thank you for meeting us here with your spirit, sustaining us, and reminding us of the wonderful truth of what was provided for us in your son. We are so grateful to have the opportunity to see our salvation in front of us today. As we come to your table with nothing but stains of our sins in our hands, you're so pleased to fill those same hands with the body and the blood of your son, graciously providing all we need for our forgiveness and righteousness. We also confess our unworthiness and inability to approach this table in our own merits. We come agreeing with you and your law concerning our sin. But at the invitation of Jesus, we come as needy sinners to the Savior of sinners. Father, we ask you to use these elements in this supper for their intended purpose as we come by faith. Feed us with the risen Christ. Conform us to him and give us the grace to love out of the love we have received in him. In Christ's name, amen. The Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given it, when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you and for many for forgiveness of sins. Drink from it, all of you, in remembrance of me. So, Ashley, if you'd like to come up, we'll serve you, and then train Reagan. Y'all can come, and then once I've served them, uh, everyone else, feel free to come and commune with the Lord at your own pace.
You may be seated. And let's pray again. Father, thank you for the redeeming love you've set upon us in your Son through the Holy Spirit. Thank you for giving your Son, who is to us wisdom from God and righteousness, sanctification, redemption, and eternal life. Thank you for the fellowship we have with you in his person and work through the Spirit you've sent. Thank you for sealing us again with the promises of Christ's covenant at his table. Give us the grace to go forth in gratitude as living sacrifices, to flee from what's displeasing to you and harms us and others, and to run hard after love toward God and neighbor. And as we heard in your law today, give us the grace to love our neighbors well, although imperfectly. And may we be constantly reminded of the love you have poured out on us so that we might respond in gratitude with the greater love of you, in Christ's name, amen. So in light of all that we've been so freely given, let's respond together with full hearts by praying as the Lord taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Saints, our salvation that we have heard, seen, and tasted today is as sure and unchanging as the God who made these promises. Jesus will not lose a single one that he has been given. We will be raised on the last day at his return. Although we're still in a fallen world, our hope is in that promise of his return. The pain of sin and death will be no more. He will wipe away every tear and make all things new. As we turn our eyes back to this present age, let's adjourn with the reminder that he is coming soon. Join me on page 10 of your bulletin for our benediction. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Amen. Come, come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. So we have delivered to you as first importance what we also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now, now Lord, Lord, you are releasing your bondservants to depart in peace, according, according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people. Hear God's benediction from Second Corinthians 13, 14, and depart in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.